So is ending Alzheimer's the monumental goal here? Well, making progress against Alzheimer's, which is our, I think, our number one public health problem, is critical. And everybody needs to get involved. So how do we do that? How do we get people involved? Well, it's so great that you're uh, covering this story and covering the walk, because the walk is a great opportunity for people to come out and be part of a community that's fighting Alzheimer's. So it's really going to take a community, starting from the laboratory where we develop new treatments and going all the way to neighborhoods um, to where we're going to actually make a difference against this disease. So everybody, Doctor, and you've probably heard it much more <coughs> than me, everybody wants a cure. But then when you talk to families too, they say prevention is key because they don't want their children to get that. What's the difference? Or is it really the same thing? Well, of course, we want to cure every disease that we can. But I think in the old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure is true definitely for Alzheimer's. So we were born with a certain set of nerve cells. And we make a few nerve cells along the way, but not that many. So our goal is to keep what we have in our brain healthy for as long as that we're, we're alive. Once nerve cells break down, it's very hard. We don't have a way yet to restore them through uh, medical treatment. So the best approach is going to be to keep, them, keep, brain, keep your brain healthy. And so that's what we're doing, and that's the focus of prevention of Alzheimer's. And you, t you can see, when you read, the keep people healthy, keep them active, reading, right. exercise, all that is important. Right. So the Alzheimer's Association, um, which is sponsoring this walk, is also sponsoring a major trial uh, coming up that uh, is going to use active exercise, a healthy diet, brain stimulation training, and good heart health to actually try to prevent uh, memory loss due to Alzheimer's. So, so how is that going to be done? Well, this is going to be, and we're going to, uh, we're very likely to be looking for participants right here in Rhode Island. So this is another way people can get involved. Uh, it's going to be for people 60 to 79 who are, memory is still okay, but are at risk for Alzheimer's based on family history or other health issues and um, people can sign up. So one way they can sign up right now, you don't have to wait, is through uh, our Alzheimer's Prevention Registry. And we have a new campaign underway. We want to have 20, 2,020 people, 2020 by 2020, we want to have 2,020 people sign up by the end of the year, by 2020. So you can go to our website and sign up. There's a telephone number if you prefer to call and do it uh, individually. Um, but we, we want Rhode Islanders to sign up and to participate, and some of those people would be eligible for this type of new uh, healthy lifestyle intervention that uh, will be coming soon. So this is different than the observational study that you're doing in the clinical studies, correct? Right. So we're doing many, and the good news is research is moving forward. The really great news is that Rhode Island is in the lead. So we're one of the leaders here. And it's really the beauty of Rhode Island is the, our size and community spirit. So we've got great academic institutions. Brown and URI are very actively involved in this effort. There, our Alzheimer's Association is really geared up uh, for this. And our healthcare systems are as well. So um, there's a lot going on uh, in Rhode Island. We're doing more than 20 studies here. Some of them involve treatments with medication to try to remove the proteins that build up in the brain that cause Alzheimer's, lifestyle type treatments, treatments, studies where we uh, try to find out what's causing Alzheimer's. Um, and so uh, I think you had some of our, you've had some of our study participants who are fantastic and I want to thank all of them. They're just out of sight, uh, you know, knock it out of the park people. Um, and they're ma really making the difference. So people really can make a difference. Just by spreading the word, we're making a difference. Some of the studies, there's no treatment. People come in and they have a series of tests because we need better diagnostic tests to tell who's going to get Alzheimer's. We hope to have a blood test soon to see who is at risk for Alzheimer's. We already have a cheek swab where someone can do it and find out more about their genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease. 
so all, all these are, you know, we have brain scans that can see the proteins. So all these are advances that Rhode Islanders have helped make possible. But that blood test, how accurate would that be? Well, before it's approved by the FDA, it has to be very accurate. Right now, the preliminary data, we're using it in research, it looks really encouraging. It, this was a, this a long time coming to get to the, this breakthrough, that, w it was that it was sensitive and, and reliable enough to use, and I think it's about two years away. I remember talking to my doctor, and I, we were talking about to try to find out if someday down the road you will be diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And he put the pen down, he turned around, and he looked at me, he goes, would you really want to know? Right. So that's what's on ev everybody, um, almost everybody is worried about Alzheimer's as they get, as they age. And one of the challenges is, you know, our memory slips a little bit with age, just as part of getting older, not even directly related to Alzheimer's. So when you slip a little, you say, oh my God, you know, here it's coming. Um, it's very, it's an individual decision about finding out more about your risk. It's important medical information. But now, well, as I'm saying, there are things that we can do about it. So you could be part of research, you could be part of a treatment. If you were found to be at higher risk, you might find out you're at lower risk, and that could reassure you. You, you, you know, people get concerned they're developing Alzheimer's, they come in here, and they find out they actually are at low risk, and the chance of developing it in the next 10 or 20 years is low. That's terrific news. You mentioned Brown University. They just got a, a donation of $500 million, more than that. Um, Obviously, it's about money in the research, correct? Right. So we really need an investment in Alzheimer's research. We have a plan from the Congress, a national plan to fight Alzheimer's with the goal of breakthrough treatments by 2025. That's not that far away. Now more investment is coming in. So the uh, Alzheimer's Association has helped improve the amount of the dollars invested in Alzheimer's research five times from the federal government. Uh, which is terrific. We're still well below cancer, even though Alzheimer's costs more than cancer. The care for Alzheimer's is more than cancer, but we're getting there. But that we're very excited about the, uh, the recent grant to Brown. is the biggest grant ever received, and it's for dementia care, develop new breakthroughs in, in providing care for people. We've had major donors to brain science and Alzheimer's here. We're gonna, we hope to have more. So we're really, Rhode Island and Brown, and you are right, you may have heard of a $35 million gift um, and just recent last week to Brown for brain science and Alzheimer's type work. This is terrific. This is really from Tom and Kathy Ryan. This is really what we need. I think Rhode Island is really in great position to be a leader, but we need people to come out to the walk, sign up for 2020 by 2020, and participate in research and spread the word. What about medicines anymore? Because I know sometimes, Diane, for example, said, you know, some of the medicines didn't work. And she goes, you know what, that's okay, because they tried that and they knew that failed. But there's going to be one down the road that is going to work. What about medicines that right. you're looking at? So we got to be really committed and really resilient because Alzheimer's is a tough disease and we are testing really some terrific medicines. Some of the new approaches that I'm most excited about right now are very targeted against specific genes that cause Alzheimer's, and we have a way to actually correct those genes. So you interviewed um, Stephen and, and Diane. They come from a family that has a mutation. We hope at some point to either be able to correct the mutation or prevent the abnormal gene from causing the damage, but in a very targeted way. This is like amazing science. What do you tell a family like that and other families that a number of family members have developed and passed away from Alzheimer's. They're worried. What do you tell them? Well, our hearts go out to those families because they are really the heart and soul of Alzheimer's. Because if you come from a family like that, it's not very common. Uh, it's only about 1% of all Alzheimer's cases. But within, if the family carries a mutation, then each child has a 50-50 chance of developing the condition. And um, I think our biggest breakthroughs are going to come from those families because they provide so much information about the, the disease. And that's why we really appreciate them coming forward. Uh, but we're very, very supportive. Uh, and we appreciate their courage and their uh, contribution to Alzheimer's research.
this disease is really affecting the baby boomer generation when you look at it, right? Well, that's why we're seeing so many cases, why it's our number one, I think it's our number one health problem, because the population is aging, and age is the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's. You can get Alzheimer's at a younger age, but by and large, the majority of people occurs after age 65, and people are living longer, and that's why we need prevention. So as you get into your 70s and 80s, your brain is healthy, your heart is healthy, your brain is healthy, and then you're going to have a good quality of life for the number of years that you're alive. I think the average age now is 78 years old. Right. So we keep people alive a long time, but they can't always be cared for. Well, that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Kid, well, that's why I'm so excited about this, the grant that Brown just received, because it's about care, and we need to really, our program is focused more on breakthrough treatments for research, but I'm so glad that Brown now has a major grant that is, is for innovation and care, because care is critical, and the cost of care and the burden of care is tremendous. Talk about the burden of care, it really, it's a caregiver's disease when you think about it. The caregiver really suffers the most. I mean, the patient, obviously, the person with the illness declines, but the family has to care for that person over many years. And if they're an older um, spouse, that's very wearying, and that has its own health risks for the caregiver. If they're a child and they're working and they have their own children, that adds to the burden of care. So yeah, this is a, that's why, we, that's why people got to come out for the walk and sign up for the registry. I mean, this is a major league problem, but the exciting news is we can do something about it. See, that's, that's the message I want to get out, is that we can make a difference here in Rhode Island against Alzheimer's. Families are mourning the loss of a loved one before they pass away. Well, there is a lot of grieving that goes on uh, in, in Alzheimer's because the person loses their ability uh, and but they're still around and the family has to adjust almost to a different type of relationship that they've had and that affects everybody in the family, all the generations. And you mentioned earlier most of our study participants come in because they don't, they know what Alzheimer's is, they've dealt with it in their family and they don't want their children and grandchildren to get it if they can protect them. All right, talk about the observational study and what you go through when you do something like that. Yeah, Break so that. we have um, a study now for people who are 40 uh, to 64. Uh, it's called the LEAD study. And they would come in and have um, an MRI scan and uh, a PET scan, memory testing, and then usually that's repeated um, once a year uh, for two or three years. And um, you don't have to come in very often, but there's a battery of tests uh, annually. Do you tell them the results or no? In that study, if they have memory trouble, they do get the results. Um, and they find out what their PET scan shows and what their MRI scan shows. And, and they also get tested for a genetic mutation. They find out if they carry that or not. What about the clinical study? What's the difference between that one? Yeah, so in a treatment trial, they can be two types of treatment trials. So one, we mentioned a lifestyle treatment where there's no medication, but the prescription is a uh, healthy lifestyle. So vigorous exercise, and that have to be regularly, uh, a Mediterranean type diet, which is associated with a lower risk of Alzheimer's, a, a training, keeping your brain uh, active through brain training activities, and then good heart health. So that's a lifestyle intervention. A medication trial where we actually can remove the proteins that build up in Alzheimer's or target genes, uh, that's, a, that's a treatment where often, let's just say our standard uh, trial would involve coming once a month, getting infusion of a vaccine that targets those proteins to try to lower them or remove them uh, from the brain. So people have to come here once a month and for the first part of the trial, they either get drug or placebo. They either get the active medicine or an inactive medicine. They wouldn't know, the nurse who gives it wouldn't know, I wouldn't know, the doctor wouldn't know as well. And then most studies have a second phase where uh, after they go through that placebo trial, then they're guaranteed to get the medicine. Can you see the improvement or no improvement in that? 
So the main daily. outcome in uh, these studies is typically memory and daily functioning. So we measure their memory like every three months or so, and we hope that the treatment group will have an improvement or a better memory than the people that don't get the active medicine. Um, and then we also look for changes in the brain of these proteins. You know, have we removed the amyloid plaques? Have we lowered the tangles that build up? What about spinal fluid tests? Are you going to do yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. So many studies either require uh, an examination of spinal fluid because we see the changes in the proteins in the spinal fluid very well. Uh, some of them, they're optional. Um, and a uh, spinal tap is, I know a lot of people are afraid of it, so I'm glad you've asked about it because it's a little bit taboo. Uh, it's a very simple procedure. Uh, we do it right here in this exam room. It takes about 10 minutes and it has a lot of hype, but usually there's very little downside to it. And obviously nothing is foolproof, but it's a help. Oh, no, it's a, it's a tremendous help. That's why we're doing it, because we get information about the disease process, because the proteins that, um, that are deposited in Alzheimer's are also deposited in the spinal fluid, so we can measure them. Diane and Steve, they're true heroes when you think about it. They're my heroes. I mean, they really are. I can't say enough good things about them. These are family members who are afflicted with the, almost the worst form of Alzheimer's. They, when they come here, they have to that the, the courage to come here to confront this in themselves, and they're not having symptoms when they come, uh, is major league. And, but they're making such a big contribution. We found out from those families, from Stephen and Diane, people like them, that the, pro, that the plaques and the tangles build up 15 to 20 years before the memory loss. We thought that might be true, but until we measured in people like um, uh, Stephen and Diane, we didn't know for sure. So, and they helped us develop these new brain scans, and the whole focus on prevention has come from people like them. So uh, they're brave, and they're, they're just terrific. You think about that, what you just said. So someone 40 years old, it could, the process could already be starting. It's scary when you Well, especially that. for families with that form of Alzheimer's. But even for the later onset, it wouldn't normally be 40. But the changes in the brain are occurring a couple of decades before the symptoms. That's good and bad. The good news is we can get in there early before there's any symptoms, any really brain cells are damaged and hopefully take those proteins out and prevent the memory loss. That's what we're trying to do. What about concussions? You know, Gronk is, uh, was on TV talking about, um, he's kind of laughing about it, which was a little strange. You know, I think I've had 10, 15 concussions in my career. There's been a link between concussions and memory loss. Is there a direct connection between concussions and eventual Alzheimer's? Yeah, so as you point out, we found out that head injury is a risk factor for Alzheimer's. And so a number of football players now who have gone on to donate their brain, we found evidence of, a, some, of another type of memory loss called CTE. And it stands for chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And it's basically getting your head banged too many times. <clears throat> and it causes brain damage. I mean, so not surprisingly, particularly some of the hits those guys take uh, in football. And it's, they have a protein buildup that's also made of tau protein, it's, and it forms a tangle. Uh, um, but it's not quite the same molecularly as Alzheimer's, but there's, an, you know, there's sort of a, a relationship. And so avoiding head injury is a good thing to keep your brain healthy. We're talking about how to keep your brain healthy. Getting, I mean, I'm a big football fan, but I'm sort of in conflict here because I know what can happen. So just for your, for your viewers, you know, preventing uh, serious brain injury is good for preventing Alzheimer's disease. There is a link. So if you come to the walk, they have something dedicated to the first survivor. <clears throat> right. And that's what they're looking for. Who's going to be the first survivor of Alzheimer's? Right. My generation, my kid's generation, do you think we'll see that? We better. No, we bet we got to. We have to do it. Yeah, your generation and the next generation, absolutely, and uh, hopefully sooner than that. 
Uh, you know, it's going to come in a wave. It's not going to come, you know, we're going to wipe it off the map, uh, you know, like a, a polio vaccine kind of thing. Um, so we've ar I've already uh, shared with you a number of advances that we're making now. All these are really important to set the, create the foundation for the major breakthroughs that are going to come. Uh, Alzheimer's is going to be a much more treatable and preventable illness uh, in the near future than it is today. And if people uh, show up and, and help us make that happen. You know, I always thought when Ronald Reagan, President of the United States, whether he penned that letter or his family yeah. member did it for yeah. him, uh, it finally put a, a face to Alzheimer's because I just saw it in my family, people didn't want to talk about it. You know, it was taboo. He, I think now that you see a president and now you see some of these athletes coming out and right. saying that, it's different now. Right. Well, no one is, well, that's why spreading the word, there's a lot of stigma about all, even talking about Alzheimer's. So having this conversation and, and other conversations like this is critical because we have to, and cancer used to be this way too, but now we have more treatments for cancer and people are more comfortable talking about it, having bike rides and every kind of, uh, you know, fundraising activity to support cancer research. We need the same thing for Alzheimer's disease. No one is protected. The, the smartest person, the most accomplished celebrity, if you look at the list of people who had Alzheimer's, it's a very, very impressive group of people of the more, you know, of the more famous type of people. And it can affect anybody. And so uh, absolutely, having people who are well-known come out and share their story and, and for family members is huge.